Good morning. I want to ask a question to uh, kick us off today. How is your heart? Uh, it's a valid question to ask of ourselves physically, but it's an even more important to ask, uh, an even more important question to ask spiritually. How is your heart? Let's go to God in prayer before we um, dive into a passage. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would enlighten us, that you would uh, enable us to see uh, where our hearts stand before you. I pray that you would forgive us of our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and help us to live in purity before you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, take your Bibles and go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says something very particular concerning what God has done in relation to mankind's hearts as a whole. And it's a, an extremely important thing to make note of and recognize as we consider where our own hearts are personally before God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, verse 9, What do workers gain from their toil? <clears throat> I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear Him. Whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? He might find some of those words a bit shocking. And Solomon is a very wise man, and this is in the Bible, and it sounds really agnostic. It's like, we are, are we going to go to the same place as the animals? I mean, how do, how do we know that the animals are just buried and that that's where they remain? And how do we know that our souls ascend to heaven? I mean, what exactly is the evidence for all of that? Well, remember that Solomon is writing in Ecclesiastes not in a way that is um, initially considering perspective beyond the here and now. He is looking at life under the sun, and he is working through, thinking aloud, venting in some cases, his own journey, his own um, progress toward a place of joy in which he finds true meaning, identity, and purpose um, personally before God. But Throughout much of Ecclesiastes, one would be forgiven for thinking that God isn't much on Solomon's mind. He is looking at things through a very pessimistic, cynical, and agnostic perspective, particularly in this passage. And yet, he says something very critical concerning what God has done with our hearts. He has placed eternity in our hearts. Now, I asked that question a minute ago, how is your heart? And we know the answer to that question is very important for our physical well-being. Around 7.6 million people in um, the world live, or rather 7.6 million in the UK, live with a heart or circulatory disease. 4 million men and 3.6 million women. Heart and circulatory diseases cause a quarter of all deaths in the UK. 
more than 160,000 deaths each year. There's an average of 460 deaths each day or one every three minutes in the UK directly linked to some heart issue. Ischemic heart disease was the main leading cause of death in private homes in England and Wales between January of 2020 and June of 2021, with 27,048 male deaths registered. Heart disease can be caused by a range of things. There's high blood pressure, uh, smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, inactivity, being overweight or obese, or a family history um, that is genetic. It can be remediated and guarded against to some degree through eating healthily, being active, staying at a healthy weight, stopping smoking, staying away from secondhand smoke, controlling your cholesterol, drinking alcohol only in moderation, and managing your stress levels. But we know that the heart is not only important physically. The heart, according to the Bible, is part of mankind's spiritual makeup. And so when we read of the heart in the Bible, he's not so much referring to the physical organ of the heart. He's referring to um, the heart, which is the seat of emotion and desire, that which drives the will of man towards action. Without your heart, you die. Without your heart, there's no emotion, there's no desire, there's nothing, there's no life. The heart is incredibly important. Well, the heart's pumping and circulation of blood is vital for your physical well-being. The heart of man is what defines and drives our spiritual beliefs and behaviors. As concerning as physical heart disease may be, I want to submit to you that there is actually a far more serious disease of the heart that infects each and every person on the face of the globe, not just um, a quarter of people. We've been afflicted with a spiritual heart disease. Our hearts have a particular design. Okay, physically, that's true. We recognize there are 13 parts of the human heart's anatomy, and there are four main chambers divided between two parts of the heart. In the passage that we just read, we see the text declares that God has put eternity in our hearts. So I submit to you that while there are four uh, main chambers of the physical heart, I want to categorize four main areas, four main chambers, if you will, of the spiritual heart. Uh, first of all, there's awareness of something more. When it says that God has put eternity in our hearts, I believe that this points to the fact that we are aware of something beyond the here and now, something beyond life under the sun, something beyond us. Awareness of something more, something beyond the here and now, which um, gives us greater meaning and purpose that actually is where we find our identity and the value of life and living. Perhaps even awareness of God and His sovereignty over time and space is in view here. God has put eternity in our hearts, awareness, awareness that the time that we have here on earth is not where it finishes. Previously, we've seen how um, there's a time for everything under the sun and every matter under heaven. But what about when time ends? Because we don't have all the time. There's something beyond time under the sun. We will one day die. There is a time to die. What happens after that? What comes next? God has put eternity in the hearts of mankind. So awareness of something more. The second chamber I want you to consider is acceptance. There's awareness, but then there's acceptance. Awareness of various elements of life generally leads to acceptance of the reality of those various areas in life. In this case, acceptance that we cannot fully discern all that God plans and purposes to do. Notice there in the passage, he says very, very clearly that God has put eternity in our hearts, yet so that no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So there's a lack of understanding, there's a lack of ability 
to comprehend all that God has planned and purposed to do. There's awareness of God, there's awareness of eternity, there's awareness of various circumstances in this life, some that are understandable, some that are confusing, but ultimately we have to accept that we are not in control. We are not in control of time and space. There's someone greater. We do not only live in this present time and space, there is something further, something more. In this case, acceptance primarily in view that we cannot know, we cannot fully discern all that God plans and purposes to do. So there's awareness and there's acceptance. A third chamber of the human heart, application. How we live life based on what we are aware of and have come to accept. Our beliefs, our foundation for life and its features. Belief always leads to behavior. Now, you, you may believe something, and you say you believe something, but your behavior doesn't match that. But you behave according to what you believe in your heart, not what you believe in your words, not what you say you believe, but um, what you actually believe in your own heart and mind. We live our life in a way of application, applying what it is that we believe in our day-to-day -day activities. So application the third chamber of this, the spiritual heart. And then finally, anticipation. There's anticipation of more, a hidden longing, a yearning for more. When we read that God has put eternity in our hearts, there's awareness of something more. There's the acceptance that we cannot fully discern all that God plans and purposes to do in this current time and space and in regards to eternity. There's application where we find our foundation for life and its features, uh, the application of which is, is rooted in our, our core beliefs. And there's anticipation of what's beyond, anticipation of something more. Now, we can have, like Solomon concludes in this particular chapter with um, this idea that's rather agnostic of who, who knows whether or not an animal goes and is buried in the ground and that's just where it ceases and our souls rise to heaven, who knows? At the same time, Solomon, he, he while he asks that in frustration and while he continues to seek in, um, this journey for his own joy, we do know that Solomon is aware of God's presence. I'm saying that God has put eternity in our hearts yet so that we cannot understand what he has planned and purpose to do from the end to the beginning. All of that indicates he knows that God is, but he's still operating only with a view to under the sun in the here and now. And yet it's clear that he anticipates something more. What is eternity? So our heart's design, awareness, acceptance, application, and anticipation are key parts, key chambers of our spiritual hearts. But now let's consider our heart's deception. Heart failure can affect one or both sides of the heart physically. In the same way, our human heart condition can spiritually attack one or multiple sides of our hearts in relation to God. There's deception. Deception which says, we have all the time in the world. Um, I'll, I'll give it some time. Maybe one day I'll believe. I'll consider that God thing on a different occasion. I'll consider whether or not to follow Jesus in the future. A mindset that says we only live once and that seeks our good and what we think is good for ourselves in the here and now, but uh, avoids asking and dealing with the big questions of life. Time is all we have is another deception. So we have all the time in the world. We only live once. That's, that's one side of the deception. But then time is all we have. And this can often lead to a, a, a fear um, of, of losing that, a fear of losing life. There's deception that the things of this world can satisfy. There's deception that uh, tricks us into thinking that we're too busy to honor God as we should. Now, we wouldn't put it that way, but we're always too busy. Something's always coming up, and we, we know what honors God, but we just find ourselves too busy. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 through 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, 
Search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. James 1 verse 26 deals with uh, the problem of deception in our hearts. I, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Hebrews 3.10 says, um, concerning the Lord, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. We're aware of God. We've talked about awareness, but we don't accept that He is the only way to fulfillment and satisfaction. We, we have the awareness right, but the deception, our heart's deception, causes us in some way to refuse to accept what either, what, whether that's verbally or practically or both, that He is the only one who can fulfill and satisfy, that He is the only one that we really need. We accept God in name, but not in nature, and we definitely don't exhibit the nature that um, is a new nature that we are created with in Christ Jesus. This is a heart's deception. If we, if we don't display that new nature, we are hiding the light that we are in Christ Jesus. We apply ourselves to wisdom, as Solomon does throughout Ecclesiastes and knowledge, but we don't apply ourselves to action. Another proof that our hearts have been deceived. We're always asking questions, we're always perhaps learning, but as another scripture in the New Testament says, we're never arriving at knowledge of the truth. We question everything, but in questioning everything we answer nothing. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth, the proverb says. and. It also talks further about how uh, the corruption and the bribes in this world, they further corrupt the heart. Our hearts can be and are very often deceived. They themselves are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Next, let's consider our heart's depravity. Okay, It shouldn't be such a stretch to consider that um, our hearts, though designed by God with this awareness of something more, acceptance of um, to, that we can't fully discern all God's plans and purpose and the application that follows on from that, and that should follow on from that, leading to anticipation um, of what's to come, anticipation of eternity, shouldn't be such a far stretch for us to realize that our hearts being deceived, they're also depraved. Anger lodges in the heart of fools, Proverbs 7 verse 9 says. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Uh, we read in, um, in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11, the hearts of the children of men are full of evil and madness is in their hearts, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 3 says. So, we are depraved. In, in our hearts, there's something that's gone wrong. There's something that's perverted. There's something that's fundamentally sick. We have spiritual heart disease. And it is going to kill us. And yet, there's something that is beautiful in this passage. While, yes, Solomon seems and, to be and comes across as in very many ways in this immediate passage as somewhat agnostic. He recognizes God he is. He's not agnostic about God. He believes that God he is. He's more agnostic about our final state. He believes that God he is. He has made everything beautiful in its time, he says. He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear Him. So we see that there's no question in Solomon's mind at this point anyway concerning God. He is aware of God. He accepts God. He, to some degree, um, acknowledges and is, is applying um, his thoughts about God. But 
the heart is still depraved. The heart longs for something more. Deliverance. Our human experience is, as Solomon begins Ecclesiastes 3, outlined everything. There is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And he he gives all of uh, that timeline of our human experience, birth, death, planting, uprooting, killing, healing, tearing down, building up, weeping, laughing, mourning, dancing, scattering stones, gathering them together, embracing, refraining from embracing, searching, giving up the search, keeping, throwing away, tearing, mending, being silent, speaking, loving, hating, warring, and being at peace. The whole timeline of our existence is outlined there, and yet there is more. Our human experience should cause us all the more to look for our hoped and long for eternity. And this is what I believe Solomon is getting at when he goes through that timeline of our human experience. He points to our hope for eternity. God has put eternity in our hearts. That is why death is so strange. That is why death is so painful. We long to be in the arms of our loved ones, uh, but most of all, to fully embrace the love of our Creator. We can't fathom eternity. We can't fathom all that God is doing during this fleeting life of ours. Solomon says that. We, we, we don't understand. We can't understand. And sometimes the beginning of this journey to joy is realizing that we aren't going to be able to have all of our questions answered. But one day, one day we will know because of the love of God that we experience through the Messiah, Jesus. This is our heavenly expectation. Our heavenly expectation that there is an eternity that you and I will experience. No, we are not just like the animals that Solomon speaks of. We do not just die and find ourselves buried um, with, with no advantage over animals. We were made in God's image to reflect His divine character. We were a special part of His creation. And though we've rebelled, and though we've fallen away, and though we've sinned, and though we've done all sorts of right, God is merciful, and He is gracious, and He brings us to a place that we acknowledge He is, and He rewards those who diligently seek Him. He brings us to a place where we see that eternity is in our hearts. We are dissatisfied with the current state of affairs and we long for something better. We long for what is good, right, and true. That is heaven. That is a new heaven, a new earth of righteousness where our Lord Jesus Christ reigns forever. When life with all its seasons goes and through the struggles I have grown, I'll look back through the script of time and see the Lord in every line. The first I breathed, my course was set. No turning back, no point to fret. The God of all, my Savior, He, within His hands, I know I'm fine. Whatever pain in life I've faced, however shame some joy erased, I'll stand before God's awesome throne and sing aloud amazing grace. With joy in life and all life's ups and downs, I walk towards the city's gates and open they with loud acclaim. I'll hear my Savior say my name. And this poem is very much indicated this heavenly expectation that we have. We go through life and there's ups and there's downs. We go through this journey that Solomon is on, and sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. We experience life's good and ill. We experience its poverties and its riches. We experience good times and we experience bad times. It doesn't change the fact that God is. And there's an eternity to come. God will judge justly because He is just. And so it's important that we ask, where is our heart? What's in my heart? How is my heart? Am I still in this state of spiritual heart disease where um, I may be aware of God, I may be aware of who He is, but I don't accept Him, or perhaps I, 
I'm aware in my conscience, but I suppress the knowledge of truth. Romans 1 talks a lot about that suppression of, of knowledge of the truth, of who God is. Perhaps um, it's application. Maybe I say I believe, but I don't behave like I believe. Perhaps I say I'm religious and think I'm religious, but I can't keep a hold of my tongue. And so as James says, my religion is worthless. I'm deceiving my heart. Perhaps, perhaps I've been deceived, to th deceived into thinking that the things of this world will satisfy. And so I prioritize those things, not God. The reality is our hearts are sick. They need healing. That healing can come only when we look at our human experience, not through the lens of our own uh, wants and our own pleasures and our own displeasures. Uh, our, we can only realize the answer to the cure, uh, this spiritual heart disease, when we find that deliverance of our hearts and looking to Christ who gives us that hoped and longed for eternity. This is our heavenly expectation. This is what we long for. This is what we um, await eagerly with joy. It's my prayer that your heart will be well. And the scriptures um, say that the one who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord shall be saved. I pray that you would do that just now. Cry out to the Lord as David, Solomon's father, did. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. The Lord will hear that prayer. He will answer. He will cleanse. He will purify. He will heal your spiritually sick heart. Solomon is beginning to ask the right questions and beginning to recognize in Ecclesiastes by this point that God he is and that he has something special for each and every one of us when we're in right relationship with him. He's given us a world of good to enjoy that's also filled with a lot of bad. But it's, but it's a world that we can, uh, we can know is not the end of it all. There is one beyond where our Lord will reign forever. He has indeed put eternity in our hearts, so seek Him.